Thank you everybody for joining in us in this webinar. My name is Bryony and I'm here to show you through the latest features in Echo View 9. So Echo View 9 was released in June just last month. It includes a great collection of new features and we'll work through this list on the screen during the webinar. So today we're going to look at the threshold offset and vegetation analysis export. We'll look at some tools for wideband data processing We'll explore some new and expanded operators and also region class symbols. We'll have a quick demonstration of some new COM functionality. We'll see sticky notes in action. We'll see how transducer and frequency automation works. And finally, we'll look at our new product, which is Echo Explore to finish. So starting with the threshold offset operator and the vegetation analysis, because I know a lot of people were particularly interested in this. Looking at the threshold offset line algorithm, this is useful for a variety of applications, such as the detection of submerged vegetation, shadow zones on slopes, which are sometimes called dead zones or roll off, depending on the literature that you're reading, transducer ring down, surface bubbles, layers in the water column, turbulence, and a whole lot more. So the threshold offset algorithm works by starting from a pre-existing line and then finding the depth at which sample values in a ping first cross a threshold of decibels. And I'll demonstrate this with a couple of quick examples in EchoView. So I have a file that I've set up here already. I've done a bottom detection on this file. But what we can also see at the top of the echogram is that there's quite a bit of surface noise and ring down that we need to exclude from further analysis. So to start with, I'm going to make a zero meter depth line, in other words, a line right at the transducer face. So I'll do that using our line draw tool and a new editable line. And I'll set this to be a zero meter fixed depth line. Press OK to create that. So we now have our start line from which to do the threshold offset. So to create a threshold offset variable, line variable, we go back to our line draw tool and we select a new virtual line from the drop down list here. So in our virtual line operator list, we have the threshold offset. Select this one and I'll press OK. So firstly, we need to set up our input operands. So I've got my SV raw pings T2, that's the echogram that I have visible, and operand 2 that I want to start the detection from, the offset from, is zero meter line. The threshold offset page, this is where we set up our algorithm settings for this line. So for this particular data file, I know that minus 67 dB works quite well, and otherwise I'll leave the default settings as they are, but I'll also tell it to go below the operand line. So we're starting from zero meters and we're looking down. If I press OK, actually, before I press OK, I'll change the display settings to make it thicker so it's nice and obvious. So on display settings, you can change the thickness of a line. I'll press OK, and Echoview has gone through and detected the bottom of the surface noise. So this is our line that we've created. This has gone through and picked out the samples below that threshold and created a line to separate it. Now that we've created this, we can go to variable properties. We can open the variable properties dialog and go to the analysis tab. And on the analysis tab, we can set the exclude above line to be the threshold offset that we set. and press OK. So now we're excluding above the surface line. If I make a selection on my echogram and right click integrate selection, we can see from our integration um, hatching on the echogram, that red hatching, that we're not including any of that surface noise in our integrations, which is good. This is what we want to do. So the next thing that we'll have a look at is detecting layers in the water column, which is quite an interesting application. I'm going to create a new file and add some data to demonstrate this. In this case, I have a Biosonics DT4 data file. 
and I'm going to take a look at the SV echogram. So not much going on here, but let's change the minimum display threshold to minus 83. I've changed the display threshold. We can see there's a bit of noise in this echogram, but there's also a layer of something happening in at about 43 meters, 40 meters range. So we might be interested in analyzing this layer. So we can use the threshold offset to help with this as well. Because it's a fairly flat layer, I'm going to start by de defining a fixed depth line at about the middle, which is 42 metres. So I'm going to create a 42 metre line, just like we did the zero metre line before. Oops. So creating a line at 42 metres. And we're now going to use our threshold offset to detect the layer above and below this based on decibel range that we're interested in. So we'll create a new virtual line, just like we did before. We'll select the threshold offset operator. I want the SV single beam pings and the 42 meter line as my reference line. I'm going to set the minimum threshold to minus, whoops, minus 92. And I'll look above the line, I'll press OK. And I'll also make this line a bit more thick and visible in the line properties dialog. So we'll do a thickness of two. And we can see this line sitting quite nicely on top of that uh, backscatter in the middle of the echogram. We can repeat the process to find that same point underneath our reference line. And I'll use a little shortcut here, and copy paste the variable in data flow rather than creating a new one. So my existing threshold offset, I'm going to copy. So I can right click on the operator and copy. And then I can right click in the data flow window and paste. So I've got the copy of my variable here. And now I just need to tell Echoview the input operands which I can do by clicking and dragging in the data flow window. So we click on the little bubble at the bottom of the SV echogram and point that into our threshold offset. And I'll also click on the little bubble for the 42 meter line and point that into our threshold offset operator. I'll then change the properties of this line to look below the operand line instead of above. And we then create another line below that's sort of capturing that layer of backscatter in the water column. Because we've now got a, a line above and below this layer, one interesting thing that we can do to explore the data is to create um, a bitmap and a mask and just focus on the information in that layer. I'll go through this part fairly quickly because this isn't a new feature in Echo V9, um, but you can come back later and review this if it's something you'd like to do too. So I'm going to right click in the data flow window and create a new variable. Right click new variable. I'm going to find the line bitmap operator in the list. So looking for a line bitmap. So I'm going to create a new line variable, line bitmap variable. And the line bitmap operator settings our start line 
is the first line that we created. And our stop line is the second line that we created. And I'll press OK. And then I'm going to create a new mask variable that takes the bitmap I just created as input, as well as the original data. And we can have a look at the resulting variable and see that we've just isolated that area that we're interested in, which is useful for further analysis. All right, so following looking at water column layers, we can also have a look at the primary reason that we added this new algorithm into EchoView, and this is for detecting vegetation. So I'll run a demonstration on a short section of data to show you how this works. Go back into EchoView. I'll close this file. Oops, and I'll open a file that I've started. So we've got some Biosonics data here, and I've set it up with a surface line at the top of the echogram to exclude the surface that was detected using, using the threshold offset operator. And I also have a bottom line that's been created using the best bottom candidate line detection algorithm and then applied some smoothing to that. I've also created a bad data region on the right of the echogram where the depth of the water is quite low and very, very close to the noise at the surface and so it's not so useful for analysis. I've fed this into a process data echogram. So if I open the process data echogram, we've got the bad data and the surface removed and we can just focus on the bottom and what appears to be some vegetation on that bottom line. So the next step is to create our threshold offset line. Again, we go back to our line draw tool on the new virtual line menu item. And we're creating a threshold offset operator from this list. For the threshold offset operator, our input is the process data variable that we're looking at. And operand two, we want to use our smoothed bottom. It's been created on this echogram. For the threshold offset algorithm settings, I'm going to set, um, stay with the default using the minimum threshold of minus 70. I'm going to turn off line relative smoothing for this data set. And I'm going to change my display settings as well. So we'll do a custom thickness and I'll choose a different color that's more visible with this color scheme. So EchoView has now created the line. If I hold my mouse over it, it can, we can see it highlighted. And so it's gone through and picked out the vegetation that's sitting on this bottom line. Now that we've created our bottom line, we can prepare to do an export of the vegetation analysis. So we prepare by going right click into the variable properties menu, or you can press F8 or use the button. And on the analysis tab of the variable properties dialog, we've got some new settings at the bottom in the vegetation settings section. So here we need to identify our vegetation line, our bottom line, um, and our analysis intervals. So the vegetation line is the threshold offset that I just created. The bottom line is my smooth bottom that I pre-created in this EV file. And we're going to do 10 ping interval analysis. So we can press okay once that's been set up. And now we can run our export. So the vegetation analysis export is accessed via the echogram menu, like all of our exports. So we go echogram, export, and the fourth entry is vegetation analysis. We can enter a file name. Mm -hmm. 
and save the resulting CSV file. And Ecoview has now completed that export. So let's take a look at the CSV file that we created, just to see what Ecoview is exporting. So I'm just going to open this in Excel and expand all the columns. So if we have a look at this export, we have some information about the 10 ping intervals that we set up for an, our analysis. The export also includes date, time and position. And we also have our metrics for the actual vegetation. So we have the mean, minimum and maximum bottom line depth across the 10 pings that we chose to export. We have our vegetation line depth, min, mean and max. So that's the line sitting on top of the bottom for each of those intervals. We have the height, mean, minimum and maximum and the standard deviation as well. And also some just counts of samples and pings that contribute to these exports. So you can get some interesting information about our vegetation here. This functionality is licensed with the Habitat Classification module. Um, if you also happen to have both this module and the Ecoview Essentials module, you'll also be able to integrate this data to get measures of um, mean SV and so on. So we hope this is really useful for people interested in submerged vegetation. And we're interested to hear if you have any suggestions for additions to this export as well. I'll also show you an interesting visualization of submerged vegetation data. So this is a 3D example. Now this is a resulting the end product of this process. What we have is a some single beam data. This is Biosonics again. And for this data, the process that we've stepped through is that we've detected the bottom and we've then created a surface from line using the bottom detections from the single beam data. So this creates a, a 3D bathymetric map, fairly low resolution because of the nature of the data, but it just triangulates between the track lines. We've then detected the vegetation on top of the bottom and we've used the same bitmap and mask process that I demonstrated with the water column layer so that we end up with an echogram that only shows the vegetation backscatter. We then created a 3D curtain using that mask and we've put the curtain and the um, surface from the line into a 3D scene so that we can look at it in 3D. And this allows us to roughly explore the bathymetry and the areas that have more vegetation, which can be quite useful and, and great for presentations. You might have seen some of these in images in our promotions so far. Okay, so that's vegetation analysis and the threshold offset virtual line. Moving on, we'll take a look at some wideband data processing features that we've added in Ecoview 9. So Ecoview 9 includes schools detection on wideband variables. This means that when you view a wideband SV echogram, you can now go to the echogram menu and select detect schools. The algorithm itself and the way to use it is exactly the same as it is for older narrowband data, UK60 data and other formats. Um, so nothing new in terms of the algorithm, it's just now available if your data type is wideband. We've also added two new operators for wideband use. Firstly, wideband frequency subset and this allows you to suppress the data from outside of a defined frequency band and also the wideband frequency select operator. And this extracts an echogram for a single frequency from within a wideband acoustic variable. These two operators apply band, band pass filtering techniques. If we have a look at the image on this slide, this shows the effect of the subset operator quite neatly. So it's two wideband frequency response graphs on the left is the original 95 to 160 kilohertz frequency response through a calibration sphere. And on the right, we have applied the frequency subset operator and we're suppressing the data 
to 95 to 130 kilohertz. So for this operator, it's important to note that using the subset operator doesn't completely remove the response from the frequencies that are outside the subset, but rather they are suppressed. In terms of the frequency select operator, what we do here is that we create a narrowband output variable from a wideband input using a bandpass filter to remove all the frequencies other than the one that's selected. For this one, it's important to note that in practice, it's not possible to only let through the specific requested frequency and no others. Instead, we use a small frequency bandwidth that's centered on the requested value. And we've implemented a five kilohertz bandwidth in this operator. We'll have a look at the operator, operator data shortly. We've also made some extensions to the wideband frequency response graph. It's now accessed in a new way. So instead of right clicking on the echogram, we access it by going to the view menu to open that up. The graph can show data from multiple transducers in the same, in the same graph, so multiple channels. And we also show the frequency response for SV and TS variables now, in addition to the target frequency response that we had in EchoView 8. We've also made exporting far more flexible than it was in previous versions. So let's take a look at some data in EchoView with a file that I've, I've set up here. So this will just take a moment to open up in EchoView. as I've set it up to open up with some operators and there are quite a few calculations to perform. So what we have, we've got three echograms visible. On the left is the original 95 to 160 kilohertz um, SV variable. In the center, we have a wideband frequency subset variable where we've told EchoView to only look at the frequencies between 125 and 140 kilohertz. So that's a wideband frequency subset. And we also have a wideband frequency select on the right hand side where we've set 150 kilohertz as the frequency, frequency of interest. And this data is collected around a calibration sphere. So to open the wideband frequency response graph, we now go to the view menu. We select the graph option and whoops, wideband frequency response in that menu is what we're interested in. If we click that, we'll open the graph and this is linked to regions or selections. So if I click on the region that's been defined in this echogram, the graph will calculate So now the graph is calculated and we can see that we've got the frequency response. If we have a look at properties, we're showing a frequency response for 95 to 160 kilohertz, as well as 160 to 260 kilohertz for the region that's been selected on the echogram. We can also choose to include our suppressed data, so our 95 Oh, sorry, our 125 to 140 kilohertz. If I press apply, the graph will continue to calculate and update. While that's calculating, we can also see in this dialog that we've changed some of the options and settings that you can apply to this kind of um, graph. So the graph is now updated and we've got the extra points on this graph. So we're looking at the SV frequency response for our different combinations of frequencies. If we wanted to look at TS or single targets that mask TS data, we select the TS option and a single target detection operator, which I've already created in this file. So TS data single, masked by the single targets we've detected, and I'm going to turn on both frequencies as well.
and the graph will now update. So just to take a look at the single target echogram, we're graphing these targets and they're averaged across these two frequencies. In terms of exporting, there are a number of ways now that we can export. The first is that we can export simply what we're looking at in this graph. So if we make the graph window active, we can go to the graph menu and choose export data from the drop down list. So we can export this to CSV. I'll cancel that for the moment. We can also select a region in an echogram and right click export region wideband frequency response. That will export the target information in that region. This is particularly useful, say, if you had detected fish tracks. Or we can make a selection. So because I've made a selection, the graph's updating. That selection, we can export selection, wideband frequency response. So we have a few options on the export. We can choose the frequencies that we wish to include. We can choose to average the results within the selection and include the minimum maximum. So I'm going to use an average here because this makes sense for the calibration sphere. Press OK and save our file. Before we take a look at that, just to point out, we can also do an export for the entire echogram via the echogram menu. So this will export every single target, the results for every single target in the echogram. But let's have a look at the file that we created. So frequency response. Open that in Excel. Maximize the columns. So when we look at the, frequency, the resulting frequency response file, we've got some information about the analysis domain that was exported. So the ping indexes, indices, <laughs> time, date, um, and the range and depth start and stop values. And then below that information, we have a row for every frequency. We have the minimum target strength, the average target strength, and the maximum target strength. So this can be useful for further analysis. You can see lots of results there across the frequencies. So outside of this, we've also included some new COM methods for wideband frequency response exports, which I'll, I'll mention later. So that's a quick look at the wideband changes in EchoView 9. And next up, we'll take a look at some of our new and extended operators. Firstly, the X by Y statistic operator, we've added some new variant statistic options. So in EchoView, to create an X by Y statistic variable, we go to our data flow window, right click, new variable, and at the very bottom of the new variable list is X by Y statistic. So if we have a look at the operator settings for X by Y statistic, the last five in this list are our new ones. So we have standard deviation, variance, mean absolute deviation, coefficient of variation, and kurtosis. These statistics give you greater flexibility in data manipulation and enable you to perform more advanced de digital image processing techniques. We look forward to seeing how people can use these. Similarly, the X by Y by Z convolution operator can be used for imaging, image processing when you're using multi-beam multi -beam data. A new operator in v 9 is the calibration subset. And this one works for both single beam and multi beam data types and essentially allows you to partition your data based on the calibration files, uh, calibration values that are recorded in the file. So let's have a look at an example of the calibration subset operator.
This is some EK, uh, SIMRAD WBAT data, where data was collected at a single frequency, 120 kilohertz, at varying pulse length and transmitted power levels. So we're looking at the original data, and we can see through this echogram that the data is changing quite significantly, which is partially related to pulse length and power. So if we go to the data flow window, we can see how we've partitioned this data. We've got our original SV echogram. We've removed background noise as a second step. And then we've created, um, at this level, five different calibration subset operators. So if we look at variable properties for the first one, in calibration subset page, we have a calibration setting field, and this lists all the different calibration settings that we can subset by. And in this case, we're using transmitted pulse length. We need to enter a range of values to subset by. In this case, we're looking for 0 0.064 milliseconds. So we've entered 0 0.64 to 0 0.65 to catch that. And we're including those pings. So we've repeated this for every pulse length, five different pulse lengths. And then we have, again, separated based on power. So if we look at the first power separation, we've got transmitted power, and we're collecting the pings that have 125 watts. And we've repeated this for every pulse length. So we've gone from one echogram to 10. And if we have a look at those echograms, these are all the individually separated out echograms. Um, we can see in some of the echograms that we have some passive pings, which unfortunately we can't currently identify from the recorded calibration settings. It'd be nice to be able to do this sometime. We also have um, some remaining differences in the echograms, and this is due to noise, essentially. You can see that the shortest pulse length, which is um, the leftmost echograms, they suffer from the most noise in this tidal environment where current speed is changing. Okay. Next, we'll take a look at region class symbols. Apologies for the fairly low resolution image here, but we'll have a look at how region class symbols can be useful in EchoView. I'll open the file that we had before. And we'll have a look at the cruise track for this data. So this is actually collected very close to home here in Hobart. We've had a boat coming back from sea, performing a calibration, so staying in one location or thereabouts for some time before heading to dock. So region class symbols are really useful in when you're viewing things in cruise tracks or along track displays. So looking at our cruise track, if I make a selection and zoom in a little closer to this area for the calibration, what we can do is we can use marker regions to identify points of interest. So if I double click at the start of where we start the calibration process, if I double click on the cruise track at that point in time, then the echogram will jump to that location. I can then hold my mouse over the echogram and press the Control J shortcut key. Control J will create a one ping wide, one ping wide marker region on the echogram. And now I want to set up my region class symbols. So to do that, we go to our EV file properties menu, uh, EV file properties dialog. So view EV file properties, or you can press the F6 shortcut key to open. So in EV file properties, on the classes page, we have a place where we can identify region classes, species and target classes. We're interested in region classes. I'm going to create a new one by clicking the new button, which I'll call calibration. So our new region class symbols can be found in the symbol drop-down list. We have some of the ones that we had previously, but we've also added some far more useful symbols fish and crabs and um, 
boats, which might come in handy. In this case, because it's for calibration, I'm simply going to use the black circle because that's a sphere, makes me think of calibration. We can also set a pixel size for our symbol and we can choose the color. So I'm going to change that to a nice bright red and press OK and OK to close the dialogs. So now for my marker region, I can go down to the region browser, which is at the bottom of the echo view window. I'm going to call this region that I just created oops, calibration start and I'm going to set the class to calibration. Now that I've done this, we can see that that red sphere symbol appears in the echogram and I can repeat the process for the end of the calibration as well. So I'll double click on the part of the quiz track at about the point we finished. The echogram will jump to that point in time. I'll hold my mouse over the echogram, press the Control J shortcut, which creates a one ping wide marker region. I'll give that the name calibration end. And we can, uh, we can see the symbol appear on that cruise track as well. So we can also use this for things like school detection and fish track region detection. So in this echogram, we can see there's quite a few schools hanging about at the point in time we did the calibration. I'm going to run schools detection and I'm going to set the class to fish, which I created previously. And so I'll run this detection and we can see once the detection's finished, that as well as our regions on the echogram, we've got our fishy symbols on the cruise track. Quite a few in this particular case. Lots of little red fish. So we can change these symbols and these colors and make it quite easy to find things when you're looking at this map down view of the cruise track or of an along track display. So moving on, new com functionality in Echo View 9. We have two new exports relevant to wideband frequency response, as I suggested earlier. We have export single target wideband frequency response and the same but for regions. So the first is for echograms and the second is for regions. And this allows you to automate extracting frequency response results from EK80 data which is much nicer than <laughs> sitting, watching and waiting for it to happen manually. So you can write scripts to extract this information for further analysis. We've also added three new go-to methods, which open an echogram and actually open a point of interest. So this is really useful for semi-automated type um, processing, where you want to automate a bunch of stuff, but then maybe you want to check um, particular points of interest that you've identified. So we can do this using go to ping, go to ping range and go to region. And so, excuse me, what I have prepared is a demonstration demonstration script. And in this script, we've actually coded uh, pop up message dialogues that show what the script is doing for the purposes of this demonstration. You wouldn't usually do this. Um, otherwise, it's a little bit tricky to demonstrate how automation techniques work as it can happen too quickly. So I'll run this script. What I need to do is change the screen that I'm sharing because it's going to run on my primary monitor. So in my com demo, I've opened Echo View and I'm going to double click a script to start it up. So. This is the first confirmation dialog. This is just something, again, we've coded into the script. We're about to open an EV file, and if I press OK, the script will continue. So we've got a message box now that confirms that we've opened this EV file and we're looking for a variable called copy1. And that variable has been found. I can see it down here on the data flow. Press OK. So we're going to demonstrate go to ping to start with and this little section of script will open the echogram in the variable that we're interested in and jump to ping number 28 using the method var dot go to ping four comma 28. So if I press OK this will happen. Okay so our echogram is opened and we can see that ping 28 is highlighted. 
The next step that the script is going to do is actually scroll through a range of pings. So it's going to scroll from ping 1000 to 1100 twice in a row once I press OK. So we can see the echogram scrolling with the marker for the ping of interest. So this is just simply a loop in the script. The next thing we're going to do is jump to a specific date and time. The date and time as shown in this message box and we've also got our method detailed here. So we're using var go to ping option one and we're identifying a date and time. So if I press OK, this is where EchoView has now jumped to. We can also go to a range of pings. So in this, in this case, the first ping in the range is on the left hand side and the last ping in the range is on the right hand side of the echogram that opens. So it will stretch or compact the echogram based on the range that you're interested in. So in this case, we've compacted. We can also, on top of this, identify a start range, so this is range from the transducer, a start and stop range. So we're going to a range of ping numbers with a start and stop range of 1 metre to 4 metres. Once I press OK, so the top of the echogram is at 1 and the bottom of the echogram is at 4 metres. We can also go to a range of dates. In this case, we're looking at um, 2 minutes in time. So we're seeing two minutes of time now. And finally, we're going to look at jumping to a particular region. So in this case, we're using go to region and we're finding the region that's called region eight. So when I press OK, Ecoview has jumped to highlight that region of interest. So that wraps up this particular demonstration. When I press OK, Ecoview will close. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully this gives you a good idea of, of how these new methods could be useful for semi-automated analysis. Next topic we'll cover is sticky notes. So sticky notes are a way to annotate your data flow. We have, in this example, we've got some transducer and variable objects that we're familiar with, and then a yellow sticky note on the right-hand side. That's identifying, in this case, where data cleaning steps are. So looking at this in EchoView, we have a file that's been set up for us where sticky notes have been used quite well. So the EV file that is opening right now is uh, using EK80 data to estimate SA correction and gain. And sticky notes have been used to make this easier for other people to understand. We've got yellow sticky notes that provide information as to what's happening at various steps in the data flow. We've also got green sticky notes to identify different sections. In this case, calibration of gain and calibration of, uh, sorry, calculation of gain and SA correction. Um, we've got orange sticky notes that identify the areas where user inputs required and blue sticky notes to find the areas where we're actually getting the calculated values out. So this can be really useful if you're sharing data flows with other people um, or even with yourself if it's something maybe you don't do very frequently and need to be able to remember how to use in the future. So to create a new sticky note, it's very simple. We right click in the data flow window, find the new entry and then at the very bottom of the new list is sticky notes. So we can select sticky note. We can enter some a name. I'm just going to put test text in. We can choose the color that we want for our sticky note and press OK. And that sticky note's been created. And we can put this anywhere we like in the data flow as just a guide. So that's sticky notes, a short but sweet new feature. The next thing that I'd like to demonstrate is transducer and frequency automation. So this is useful for, for sorry for people working with multi-frequency data. And essentially it has two main components. 
First is that ECOV will now automatically create new transducers at specific that identify specific frequencies based on the transducer or channel number recorded in the data file. So it'll create those transducers and allocate the raw variables to it. But the second, uh, slightly more clever part of this feature is it can reassign transducer numbers. So this is particularly useful in cases where perhaps um, your transducers were switched around, switch between T1 and T2 to the usual arrangement that you have, or perhaps you collected data with a different frequency combination. You might have left one transducer out. We can then use this reassignment to make our pre-prepared templates work really easily. So I'll uh, demonstrate this in EchoView for you now. So in EchoView, I'm going to create a new EV file and add some data. So I'm adding a multi-frequency raw file, which in this case has six frequencies from 18 up to 333 kilohertz. And these, what we can see when I added that data is that the transducer objects were all automatically created. And the different, oops, the different variables that are derived from the data have all been appropriately allocated to each of these variables each of these transducer objects. So that saves a whole bunch of time in setting things up when you're working with multi-frequency data and means it's really easy for you to enter the transducer specific information such as the location. What I'm going to do now is add a second data file to this data set and in this second data file it's been recorded where T1 has 38 kilohertz. So we're adding T1 38 kilohertz data into an EV file where T1 is actually 18 kilohertz. So let's see what happens when we do this. So I'll add the data file. And what's important here is we can see there's a new message down here in the messages toolbar of Ecoview. Always important to keep an eye on the messages toolbar. If I double click this message to read it, we can see what Ecoview is reported to happen. So in that data file, T1 has been reassigned to T2 to match the frequencies that have been set up for the transducers in this file. So this is hopefully a very useful tool that will save people a lot of time, particularly if things have changed in their hardware setups between surveys. It's controlled by several settings um, in the file sets properties dialog. Moving along, Finally, we'll wrap up looking at Echo Explore. Echo Explore is a new product that we have released. It's the first version of it. And Echo Explore is cataloging software that will find hydroacoustic data files on your computer. It'll extract basic information from those files and then allow you to browse the data that's been located in a list or on a map. So you can kind of think of it like iTunes, but for hydroacoustic data files. So let's have a look at Echo Explore. So what we're seeing here, I've got some data already loaded into my database. You can set, you can tell Echo Explore where to look for data using the locations menu and add remove. So I've set it just to look in my C drive. Um, this first version of Echo Explore will only be able to look on your personal computer or any USB drives that you have plugged in. It won't be able to search network drives. So I'm looking in my C drive. We can see on my world map all the bits of data that I have on my computer from various places around the world. So we've had a question, will the ability to search networks be included in future Echo Explore versions? Yes, definitely. That will, that will come around in the next version of Echo Explore and will be a feature that's available with the paid version of the program. What I will do is I'll show you, we can zoom in and look at some data in close detail. So the little square boxes just highlight where data is found on that zoomed out world scale. And I'll zoom in on some data that's from a lake in North America, Scott Lake, I believe. And what we can see is that we've got our survey of this lake. We've got different data files. 
that have been coloured with different colours and markers that show the start and end of each data file. What we can do now that we have this, it's one of the features of Echo Explorer is filtering and searching your data. You can either manually enter values in the left hand panel for geographic position, date and time, and data file format and keywords in the file name. We can also make a selection on the map window, right click and set the geographical position limits. So when I click this, the left hand panel for geographic, geographical position will update with the latitude and longitudes of the selection that I made. I can then click search and my list of data will be filtered down to just the data files that were within that area on the map. The other thing that is useful for people whoops, using EchoView, if I open EchoView beside, close my file, open a new file, is I can select the data that I filtered, click and drag across to the EchoView file sets area. If I release the mouse, we can see that the data files have all been added. So a really easy way to open the files and look at that same selection of data. So that's just a very quick look at Echo Explore. We'll um, release more information about this shortly. Echo Explore itself will be available for download from the EchoView website very, very soon. We'll send out a newsletter when that's available. We've got lots of ideas for future versions of EchoView and we're also very interested to hear what you would find useful in terms of the types of data, the information that's extracted and any tools that you would like to be able to use. So please send back any feedback that you have. So to wrap up, um, there's lots of other changes in EchoView 9 that we don't have time to cover today. And you can see the help file that's installed with EchoView to read a full list of those changes, both general changes and those that are specific to certain makes and models of echo sounders. So I encourage you to peruse this list. And if you have any questions about new features in EchoView 9, please send me an email or you can also contact support at echoview.com anytime at all. To get the latest version, you can either download EchoView 9 directly from our website in the download section, or you can run EchoView, go to the help menu and select check for updates. The updater will be launched and it will list any new versions that are available that you can install on your computer. And what I'd like to point out here in particular is there's a little link called view the release notes. If you click this link, you'll get a pop-up dialog that both lists the changes that we've included in EchoView 9, plus specifies any changes that we've made since the original release. So we can see that we've released one update to EchoView 9 since we originally released it that contains a couple of bug fixes. We always strongly encourage people to update to any new versions, any bug fix versions that are available as they're released. So keep an eye on the software updater as the easiest way to find these. So thank you very much. Thank you very much everybody for participating. We're really excited to have EchoV9 available to use. And please don't hesitate to get in contact with me if you have any ideas or requests for new features in future versions of EchoV. We've started work on EchoV10 and we're really looking forward to another great version in the new year. So thank you very much everybody.